afternoon, everybody. Um, I know what you're all thinking. Um, what's Greg Wallace from MasterChef doing chairing a panel? Um, I haven't got a day off. I'm actually Jason Stockwell. We're gonna, we've been told we're running out of time, so what we're going to do is going to really briefly introduce ourselves and then get into the subject at hand. I can't come on stage without mentioning two things. So I'm a trustee of B-Corp, I'm an entrepreneur for 20 years, and I wrote a book last year called Reboot, which was about this topic. And so what's that? Yeah, it's still available, yeah. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> it, it's, um, it's on Amazon, or it's ATP on eBay, actually. So if you want to go and get a copy of that, you, you're more than welcome. Uh, and I'm also, next week, I'm launching a fund to invest in business, a private equity fund, um, specialising in culture and all the things that B-Corp represents. So if you want to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, you can hear a bit more about that. But I'm going to go to the panel now. They've got a lot more interesting things to say than I have. Well, everyone introduce yourself briefly, and then just talk for a couple of minutes about what the topic means for them. So, Rosie, why don't you start? So, um, looking at the future of kind of business is a pretty huge topic. And certainly when we're setting strategy at Cook, we're looking at three different things, three different macro trends that are affecting everything. Uh, the first of those is technology, excuse me, um, and how that's going to change business. The second is sustainability. Obviously, that's big for everyone, being a food business, that's huge. And the third is people power. And I'm just going to talk a little bit to the people power. Um, sort of macro trend that's happening. And, you know, I'm a really great believer that humans have created this crisis. Um, and if we can create organizations where humans are thriving uh, and can lead and can help others in their organizations to thrive too, we will make good decisions and we will lead our way out of it as well. And I think increasingly all the human science is telling us that humans thrive uh, in relationship and community. Um, you know, there's the Harvard Grant study that's been going forever. Uh, more recently, some Gallup staff, Google um, research. Um, so we know this idea of community at work, I think, is um, a really important way in which we can help people thrive. Um, and certainly at Cook, when we're looking at this, we're over 1,000 people now. We're still growing. We haven't cracked it. Uh, we're wanting people to, to come to work to Cook and have a sense of belonging, um, to have opportunities to grow and fulfill their potential, to be heard, to be appreciated and valued for their contribution. Um, fair and proportionate reward, um, a really important structural piece of community. Um, you know, well-being is prioritised. And also where there's some joy, because I think the workplace should be a place of joy, and I don't think we talk enough about joy at work either. So we're on this mission to create this kind of workplace community, and um, unfortunately I can never tick it off my to-do list because uh, it's an ongoing project and, and, and the work will never be done with it. Um, and so I just thought I'd share just literally three, three things that we do um, to help create that community. And the first is we create space for people to connect. So we all need powerful human connection, and I think workplaces need to provide the space for people to make those connections. So we shut our shops for a day, we shut our manufacturing sites for a day, we pull people together. We have something called the Free Range People Days, where we all go and be free range. Um, but that time to really connect and get united in our purpose, what we're trying to achieve, has been super powerful for us. Um, I think the idea of giving people a voice um, is, is something that we would all agree is necessary. In an organisation of a thousand, it's tricky. In a big corporation, more tricky. Um, but there are, are ways to do it, and we have a value, which is Churchill's pig, which is a dog looks up to a man, a cat looks down on a man, but a pig looks the man in the eye and sees his equal. And so that really underpins everything we do at Cook. And this idea of... Um, people having a voice is you often, you know, you know you're in trouble when someone says, can I have a bit of Churchill's pig? Mm. Or colloquially, it's called a pork talk. Um, mm -hmm. but, but what it does... Don't Google that, by the way. It gives everyone a voice. And, you know, we ran a Churchill's pig week for everyone to have their voice. You know, 250 people out of 1,000 are responding. Uh, all of those are getting a uh, an individual response from a senior leader. So that voice thing, I think, is really, really key. Um, I think, and the last sort of third thing, I think, is about leadership. So not just at the top level. You know, we've got a senior team at Cook that are just brilliant and so aligned. And we go away and work on the business, but we work on ourselves too. Um, and we pull all of our leaders out. So, um, you know, all our shop managers, kitchen managers, we'll take them out 
uh, for two days, that's 200 people, and we do leadership development. And we say, how can we create community? How can we get united behind our purpose? How can we do more? Um, and serve that community and the people kind of that we're leading better. So I think leadership at every level needs to be really united, and that's a conscious effort. Um, and finally, because I've banged on enough, um, I think there's a big job if you're really serious about workplace community and powerful human connection that there are some barriers that need to be removed mm -hmm. that the corporation has put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be that uh, disproportionate reward um, or pay differentials or top-down performance appraisals, you know, some known wisdoms that are nonsense if you're on mm -hmm. powerful human connection. There's a couple of things I want to, if we don't get a chance to talk about today, I mean, Cook was one of the inspirations for Simply Business becoming a beacon, and me and you and Ed and James, and I think if, if you can grab Rosie afterwards and talk about the Dream Academy as well, it's an amazing initiative and really inspirational. We'll come back to that if we get a chance, but cool. on the subject of belonging this year, would you introduce your background and just talk a little bit about your experiences with that in mind in particular, because I know it's dear to your heart. Yeah, um, so I'll also just start by giving some context. Um, my name's Nishita, I run a mission-driven organization called Collaborate EQ, and one of my clients is the Royal Society of Arts, so I'm currently part-time working as part of the Future Work Center at the RSA. My background started off, as did a few others, in management consulting, a decade living out of a suitcase, traveling and working in different countries, and then quite traditionally, again, following on with business school. Um, and during my time at business school, I worked at Amazon. And then after business school, I joined the founding team at Uber, based out of London when we were 20 people, and spent just under two years there until 2016, when I decided to leave after having experienced this phase of blitz scaling, as we called it, um, branching out from just operating across London to across the UK, and then moving to the Nordics and scaling operations across the Nordics. And I think for me, what I was exposed to during that period is how fragile culture is and how important culture is, because ultimately it led me to walk away um, you know, from a position that on paper looked great, from a, a company that at the time was recognized as being one of the fastest growing, disruptive, innovative companies in the world, to actually ha realizing there's a misalignment in my values here and I can no longer invest my time for an organization that I don't align with in terms of values. Um, and I think it's important to tell that story because that's kind of what I describe now as like my learning stack. Um, and so now the work that I'm doing is working with organizations on their learning journeys. So it touches upon diversity. Um, and what's really important to mention here is that a conversation around diversity is an incomplete conversation. To have the full conversation, you really need to talk about diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. And just to make the point clear around equality, a culture of equality is everyone has equal access, but a culture of equity is when recognizing that people have different starting points and there is privilege in the system. Um, actually, if you think about the word diversity and the root of the word diversity in Latin it has the same root as the word um, divorce, so actually, the Latin root of this word means to turn away from. So just taking that in, into perspective, like really the conversations that are, having, that are being had around us, um, I think we all need to advocate for complete conversations, which makes us focus on this string of, yes, we need full diversity. What does that mean? Visible and invisible layers of diversity, because it is definitely not just gender and it's definitely not just race. There's a lot... To, there's, you know, countless invisible layers of diversity, and it's all about enrich, enriching our work through cognitive diversity, and it's the diversity of perspectives that we all bring, regardless of physically what we look like. So um, I think it's important to make that point. And then what I'm doing now is working at this intersection between the future of work and organizational change. Um, and I'm working with organizations, taking them on a learning journey. And what does that mean? So diversity, inclusion, belonging is one aspect of the learning journey. Another aspect is psychological safety. What do I mean by that? In order for organizations to have cultures that people feel comfortable enough to have a voice and share their opinions, we need to make sure that we have cultures that are safe. And a good example for that is if you're in a meeting room and you have someone who's an intern or new to your organization and they are sitting there with a couple of members of the C-suite or senior management, 
do you feel that the most junior person in that meeting has, feels comfortable enough to make their voice heard to go against or to challenge an opinion that's being made by the most senior person in the meeting room? So that's just a quick test to think about, like when you're in your next meeting, do I feel like I have created an environment in this meeting room or in my workplace where the youngest person feels comfortable to challenge me? Because actually, this leads to my second point around GQ. So the World Economic Forum has coined this term GQ, which is generational intelligence. So we know IQ, we know EQ, but GQ is basically how do we unlock the... Um, knowledge share that can be um, created when, as the different generations within the workplace, we start learning from each other and respecting each other, because typically in the workplace today, you have five generations working within one office space. Um, so taking that into account, and then thirdly, there's a point around, we've heard about systems change, but I really think within the organization, you need to work like a system, and what does that mean? It means Traditionally, there are silos. We work in siloed ways. How can we weave through these silos? Um, and how can we create trusted networks within our organizations that actually cut across hierarchy, cut across the silos, because collectively, we'll be able to solve the problems with the um, talent that we have within our organization. So how do we work more like a system um, within the organization? And I'll leave it at that for now. And I think the GQ stuff's in particularly relevant today. I think when people, not that the panels haven't been brilliant, but the students and their poems, I think, will be the thing to take away for most people, actually. So, Dan, Daniel, um, you know, Dan is doing some work at the cutting edge of AI, but actually, I, I saw you talk a couple of months ago, and what was fascinating was the, the way you're building the culture in your own company. So, the text of Go and Google, it's some amazing stuff on actually breaking down some of the mythology around AI. But can you talk a little bit about your experience and also building your own company and things you're doing there? Yeah, so I, I do three things. I run a master's program in UCL. I've got about 100 students that apply emerging technologies to solving business and social problems. So I've got a good feel about where we are with respect to utilizing these technologies. And Satalia is the second thing I do. I, I, there's about 120 people distributed across Europe. And how I'm trying to design the organization is very much like a swarm. So we don't have any managers or fixed hierarchies. We don't have any KPIs. We have Everybody's free to do whatever they want, work on whatever they want, however they want, wherever they want. We even go so far that people every, every year make public recommendations for their salary and everybody votes on whether those salaries should be reduced or increased or kept the same. <laughs> and we, we use machine learning to determine how many votes one person has for another. So if I've worked very closely with you over the past year, if I'm very knowledgeable about your domain, then I will have more votes for your salary than other people. So we really try to solve this hierarchical problem. And, and my, my goal is to, is to use these concepts of AI and augmented intelligence and peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms to distribute and decentralize decision-making across an organization to operate much more like a swarm. And uh, if this is going to sound a bit crazy, but my goal is not just to scale that to 200 people or 2,000 people. I want to scale that model to a planet. So I want to try and scale... This planet, yeah. This planet. And the I, not a planet with 100 people on it. Uh, and uh, the, I guess what, what I'm trying to figure out is how could we create a world where we all are free to work on the things that we want to work on wherever, however, whenever, and are fairly remunerated for that contribution. I, I think that the way that we structured the planet is silly with companies and countries, and, uh, and I think that uh, we are, uh, with this objective function of trying to maximize GDP, we're not creating a sustainable future for our planet. So um, what I'd like to do is figure out how can we scale a platform to unlock the creative capacity of everybody on the planet to boot up ideas and resource those ideas globally, and, uh, and those ideas are driven forwards not for profit, but for purpose. Mm -hmm. with, with that as a theme then, so the, 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 there was a study a couple of years ago at Oxford from Fran Osborne that talked about 47% of jobs that exist today are going to go in the next, uh, by 2030. So I'd love to get your views on A, whether you think that's true, whether it's a problem, whether it's an issue, and, if it, uh, and what's our reaction to it? I think Daniel's led on that, I guess, but it feels like there's a transition stage in the Daniel into, the sort of going from the structures that exist today to the democracy that you've created. So is there an intermediate step? Or do you think we just need to go full throttle into that, that world? So I think, I think what we're seeing, um, AI, these technologies, uh, removing tasks and freeing people up to do um, more interesting tasks. But I think like the horses in the 1920s, mm. when, when they invented the cars, actually we, we had more horses because we needed to move steel around and make more cars. But what they didn't realize is that the horses were creating their own demise. Very quickly, horses went from 
de declined by 90 percent. And my concern is over the next decade, we will see these technologies freeing people from tasks. But at some point, we will free up people from whole jobs. Mm -hmm. And people have said, well, well, we've always created new jobs. But actually, I would argue that any new jobs we can create, we can build AIs to, to do those jobs. And mm -hmm. uh, I do think that it is different this time. And I think in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we may see a lot of job losses. And I don't think our economies are set up to deal with that. Yeah. But I think the other thing Yuval Harari talked about, that it's not a problem of jobs, it's a problem of meaning as well. And we've sort of, I think we've sort of got lost in the debate around, you know, we sort of forget that, that paid work is a construct from the 17th century, you know, the chart of monopolies. And we sort of, the reason for living isn't just working, right? So do we need to reclaim that sense of meaning and belonging potentially in the sheets? Is that really, let the machines do what they've got to do. Maybe we can just sit home watching Netflix or gardening in my, in my case, so. I think that's, part of the journey um, and I think an important part of the learning journey is um, there's this really interesting data point that for anyone entering the workforce in 2030 they will have to reskill or upskill between eight to ten times to stay relevant during the course of their career and I think that's a really powerful point to make us all as individuals and as organizations realize the importance of reskilling and upskilling ourselves um, that's a problem, that's an opportunity, however you want to frame it, but it's a shared uh, responsibility. So when I refer to the learning stack that I had earlier and my background, I think it's important to also start to look at people and recognize their skills in terms of learned experience and lived experience. Um, you know, the value of soft skills in the workplace, these stories will come out once you hear the lived experiences that people have been through. Um, and that allowing people to, you know, this terminology, bring their whole selves to work. But as organizations, we need to create cultures of continuous learning because we need to make sure that our employees, for them to stay and for us to retain our talent, as a, as a potential employee, I would want to be in an environment where I'm continuing to learn and grow. And if that's not happening, mm -hmm. I will go somewhere else. Well, it's interesting, so it's Simply Business, again, which is the business I'm, I'm vice chair of, still we're advocating for a four-day week. So part of the problem, I think, is technology comes in and displaces some of these jobs. There's no space for people to be able to rethink their future or train. So we've tried to, we did an experiment, we in The Guardian a, a month or so ago about how do we take this advantage of technology and then give people the opportunity as a bridge to potentially that disruption. That's, I've got no idea what's the right answer, but it just, we felt helpless around this tide of change that's being predicted. So in, in Cook, as you go from sort of manufacturing and stuff that can get automated, Rose, is there stuff that you're thinking about today? How we, how we, go, how we build that bridge to the future that Daniel's um, envisioning? No. <laughs> well, that was good. That was, that was, that was good then, no, no, it? no, I've got more, I've got more. Um, mm. so, so, so my, like, my, my really honest answer is the world of AI, and I think it's coming, and I think what Daniel's saying is completely relevant. It also feels quite a long way from me on a sitting born industrial estate with manufacturing and retailing right now. So I think there is you know, a long way for this to go. And I think all I would say is what I know to be true of humans, I think, is that we need belonging, that we thrive in community, we need opportunities to grow, we need a voice, we need all of those purpose and meaning, we need those basic things to thrive. And I think as the rise of technology comes, we will need that even more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so our workplaces have to find a way to deliver that as well as the intelligence that AI can provide. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have the answer for that right now. So, but the sense of community and belonging that you've created, can we talk a little bit about the Dream Academy? Because I love this idea of how you... Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's, on principle, it's nothing to do with work, really, is it? I mean... So the Dream Academy, uh, for those of you who don't know, and Al, our Dream Manager, is here, so find him later because he's awesome. Um, it is, uh, we employ a lot of people who haven't had a lot of brilliant education, haven't had a lot of input, and the Dream Academy exists to help people articulate what their hopes and dreams for the future might be, and offers life coaching to help them get there. So people come in and, you know, someone came in and they wanted to smile with confidence because their teeth were short. Uh, and we've had uh, someone writing a book. We've had people wanting to leave to get an office job. So we've helped them do that. And, you know, these dreams are not, you know, when we started it, I was like, oh, no, what if everyone comes in and wants to be prime minister? Like, we can't help them. But, uh, you know, one of the big learnings from it is we seem to, we, our hopes and dreams seem to be within our reach. And that's been one of the extraordinary kind of learnings. And so many people have achieved so much. Um, 
Yeah, and as I say, Al, the dream manager, is here. And it's a programme we continue run, but it has absolutely transformed the lives of some of the guys in the kitchen who are actually no longer with us because it's transformed their lives that much. <laughs> that's, <laughs> a, that's a good outcome, right? Yeah. Though, isn't it's it? a so, great outcome. It's a great outcome. And she, I'd like to draw back on your time at Uber then. So uh, obviously that's a poster child for a number of things that I probably won't go on the record as saying. So, so was, that, was that a wholly salutary experience for you or were there, was there positives that you take away from that in terms of you know, what, what it's become today? But there's a tricky period there for them where they didn't know they were going to make it, right? Um, no, it was definitely like an incredible experience to be part of the organization from 2014 to 2016 um, at this period of blitz scaling um, and just to see how, um, how quickly we're able to build a solution and scale and spread it globally. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the approach they took. Um, for various reasons, but just to see the power of have, working in a very networked way, in mm -hmm. a sense, because yeah, you have HQ and SF, and then we have all the regional hubs, and then we have all the cities, but we're all very networked and kind of close together. And one thing that I found particularly, um, well, I, it was great, it's basically each time a mistake happened or each time something went wrong, that you send out, you have a, sw a SWAT team that basically deep dives into what was the problem, and you have a whole kind of company-wide email that's shared around, this is what went wrong, this is the analysis, this is how we fixed it, this is how we make sure it doesn't happen again. And in a way, it is celebrating failure in the sense that it's not, it wasn't a blame culture, it wasn't about, this is the team that made the mistake, it was actually like, let's take and surface all the learnings that came out of that, and let's share it with all the different cities so you guys don't make that same mistake again. And so I think, there's, an, there's a really powerful quote by this author, Elif Shafak, where she talks about um, information is different to knowledge, is different to wisdom. And the reason why that really resonates with me is because tech companies and the world, the way that we're moving in the world today, we recognize information, which is what we all have access to. Knowledge is how we interpret that. But actually, wisdom comes with experience and time and making mistakes. And I feel that I have a fear that we're not, we're not paying enough attention to the wisdom in terms of uh, from you know, traditional legacy companies or people who have worked in ways that are maybe conflicting with the way disruptive Silicon Valley tech companies are moving, but we actually need to, going back to the point around generational kind of knowledge capture, we need to listen to the wisdom and the reason why things have worked well and things have not, and instead of just looking ahead without looking back. Great. And Danny, just with a couple of minutes left, you know, you're the closest to the technologies that people are worried about, I guess. So is there any sense or perspective on how close that sort of AI Armageddon is? And you, as a practitioner, should we, be, should we be as fearful about it? Or do you think it's far enough away that we've got time to recalibrate our philosophical models and systems? No, I think uh, so we build systems that free people from, from their tasks. And uh, we have companies where their employees sabotage those systems and are really concerned about the impact on their jobs. So I'm at the forefront. Um, uh, we try to ch work with companies that are thinking about growth as opposed to reducing costs and removing people, but um, I am deeply concerned about it because I'm at the forefront mm. seeing people remove, yeah, lose their jobs. Okay. Yeah. Well, that wasn't the uplifting note I was hoping to finish, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so I'll be honest, that hasn't really worked out how I planned. But, um, so the machines are taking over, Uber's going to be a beak or, and uh, it was hashtag pork talk, I think. So, and, uh, <laughs> But look, um, we're running out of time, so just thank you. I hope we can continue the conversation in the break. But if we can put a round of applause for the panellists, that would be appreciated. <laughs>